Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all on this seventh Sunday of Pentecost. A special welcome to anyone worshiping with us for the first time, either online or here in the sanctuary. Thank you to Patrick Clerkin, our tech person today. The altar flowers are given by Pastor Hughes in loving memory of his mother, Dr. Dolores Stort Starbird. Up there. And the cupola will be lit this week by Pastor Hughes in honor of the congregation and the recent celebration of our 30 years of shared ministry here at UCC. Sunday school today will be making some cosmic slime, which I have sample here. It's full of sparkles and it glows in the dark. So we will have some fun with that. Uh, next week, there will be a cosmic craft and some Mars themed games. And each week this summer, we are continuing to work in the garden, harvesting the vegetables to donate to the food pantry. If you are young at heart and would like to volunteer to help with the summer activities, please let me know. There's also a donation list in the Hilltop News. I've had a few people ask what they can donate for our summer adventures. So if you have any of the items on the list laying around at home, please feel free to check that list and bring them in. Don't forget to bring Flat Jesus with you on vacation, wherever you go. There are more Flat Jesuses available if you do not have yours yet. You take a picture wherever he may go and send it to us so we can all see Jesus' travels this summer. I would like to call up Alicia McGoldrick, who has an announcement. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Alicia McGoldrick, as Gail said. I'm a member of the nominating ministry. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm not surprised. I'm a bit of an introvert and keep to myself, so... Uh, You'll have to seek me out. Anyway, this week in the Hilltop News, there was a blurb about the openings for the nominating ministry to fill. The nominating ministry looks at all of the openings on the ministries and seeks out volunteers. We have 142 openings to fill to keep the church running, and that's a lot. Um, we are actively working to call that number down the best we can. We're asking ministries, do you really need six people? Um, we recently requested of council that we disband environmental stewardship in order and ask all of the ministries to consider environmental impact as they go forward because it's coming, it's becoming second nature to us all. So we're working on getting that number down, but we still have six openings. Um, we still have openings on care, CE, Christian Education, Frosty's Fair, Hilltop, House, and Faith and Fellowship. So if you hear this message and think, I could help out there, I'll be around in coffee hour, and my email was in the Hilltop News this past week with that blurb, and will be in, I think, this week's Hilltop News as well. Thank you. I have no idea how to turn that off. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. Also, everyone is invited to stay following the service up in Fellowship Hall. There will be lemonade and refreshments. We thank the Redloff family for hosting that this morning. Also, as you come into the sanctuary on the table to the right, you will find printed bulletins of the service, also song sheets for any hymns that might be new. And then finally, during the summer, we are bringing back the hymn requests and each Sunday during the summer, all of you get to choose the final hymn. It needs to be one that is in the hymnal. And these little sheets are on the table to the right. You can fill them out with the title and the hymn number and give them to the ushers as the offering is received. And Horatio Castro, our music director, will pull one randomly each week. And also, each week you're here, you can keep submitting the same one. We save them all, so you get more chances at the hymns that you would like. Are there any other announcements? If not, then let us draw near to God's throne of grace and celebrate the love that is from everlasting to everlasting and is with us here, even now.
call to worship. With what shall I come before the Lord? And bow myself before God on high. God has shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of me? But to do justice. And to love kindness. And to walk humbly with your God. Come, let us walk invocation. God, whose name is to be hallowed, and whose truth is to be heeded, behold your faithful sons and daughters, who come to this day to honor you with our words of praise. We know, however, that words alone are not enough. So we ask you now to lay your hand upon our hearts that we may be inspired to also you with our deeds of loving kindness. This we ask as disciples of the risen Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Please be seated. In school, we learn our ABCs. As we grow in our faith, we learn what I like to call our BCDs. Because we believe, we care. And because we care, we do. So let us call, answer God's call to follow Christ and be his servants in the service of others as we come now to God's altar with our tithes and our offerings. join me in the prayer of dedication. God of grace and everlasting glory, behold your faithful people who come to you now to place this offering upon your altar. We bring you our tithes and offerings, knowing that our Savior has summoned us to join him in his passion and victory. Lord, we pray that we may be worthy of that sacred calling to all that we give and all that we do, for we pray it in his name. Amen. Gail, so who contributed to the mystery box this morning? Arden and Dorothy. Arden and Dorothy, a double header. Double header. I suppose I should be twice as worried. Maybe. Shall Are we? we going to invite the children up? Well, I thought I'd look at it first oh. and then invite the children up. Okay. All right. Oh, what are these, chopsticks? Chopsticks. Okay, all righty. <laughs> I'd like to invite the boys and girls to join me. Good morning. 
I am so pleased to see all of you today. And we have here chopsticks. And I'm afraid that we've got a trend going on here. Last week we had broccoli and coffee, and I said I didn't like either one. And by the way, to set the record straight, I had a couple of people ask me after the service last week, if I've never tried broccoli, how do I know I don't like it? And the answer is I have tried it, and I don't like it. And I have to say, first of all, I don't know how to use chopsticks. Is, is this the right way to do it? Sort of? I'm going to ask a Minister of Discipleship to come in here and, and, and show me how you use chopsticks. Why don't you come a little closer? I want to make sure you're on camera here. Well, let me see if I can do this here. Wait a minute. So, like, which, do it again, please. <laughs> so it's this finger and this finger and that finger. Okay, so this finger, this finger, this finger, and that finger. It's closing on the wrong end. Well, I'm also right-handed and you're left-handed, so I don't know I, if there's yeah, a difference. Yeah, this is true. I can't this, use them with my left hand. This is true. And, you know, well, first of all, I was going to say, because I don't like vegetables, there's a lot of Chinese food that I don't like. But I will say that May makes the best crab rangoons. I love her <laughs> crab rangoons. <laughs> do you use chopsticks to eat them? No, I do not. You can use that for rangoons? You can. Oh, I suppose. Uh, but see, I'm still no, I don't know how to do this. I, I just can't do it. And part of it is I'm left-handed. And my mother had a heck of a time teaching me how to tie my shoes when I was little because everything is just the mirror image. It's just opposite of how people who are right-handed to do it. And you know what? I can't do this. I'm still not doing it right, am I? You're almost there. You have to be able to move this, though, so you can pick stuff I up. I know. That's what I can't get done. They're, they're going in different directions. You need the training ones where they're connected to the top. Oh, really? They have yeah. training ones? Yeah, that's how my kids learn to use them. Oh, I'll have to get some of those. So, you know, there are things that we can't do. And that's okay. Because nobody can do everything. I can't use chopsticks. There's a lot of other things that I can't do. And that's why I had to ask Mrs. McLaughlin for help. She can help me learn how to use chopsticks. And that's really what a community of faith is all about, a church. We come here and we help each other with things that we can't do or when we need some special love because someone is sick and really, we live in a world where everybody's competing to be better than everyone else. And we certainly want to do our best and be our best. But we have to remember that God loves us even though we're not perfect. And that's okay. And we can ask for help and we can be there to help others. So let me give these back. Thank you very much. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for chopsticks and Chinese food and all the wonderful things that you fill and put in this world. Help us uh, to always try to do our best, to follow Jesus as best as we can. But when we need help, be there and remind us that it's okay to help and ask for help. Amen. Thank you.
be seated. Please join me in the responsive call to prayer. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. Let us our hearts, Lord. Good people, let us enter into this time of stillness and be one with our God. My sisters and brothers, are there prayers that you would like to lift up to the Lord this day? Yes, Jane. Pam Duchar's daughter, Pamela, had a baby boy. Yes. He's very tiny, he's quite early, and they need our prayer. Yes, so this is Pam. Duke Shire, and her married name is, is Burton. Uh, she gave birth to a little boy, Connor. He was born and weighed, I think, three pounds, five ounces. He is in the neonatal intensive care unit at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. He is doing well, but he is going to be there for a couple of months. We ask that God's spirit be upon him and give him strength. Lord, in your goodness. Amen. So some of you may have heard Andy Graham is one of the latest to contract COVID. Uh, my understanding is he is feeling better, and we pray that God's spirit will, of healing will continue to rest upon him and that we will soon be beyond all of this. Lord, in your goodness. I lift up in prayer John Wiklansky. He is now at the Veterans Hospital in West Roxbury, and he, as many of you know, had some seizures, and there is a recovery that is going to take place from that. We pray that it will be shorter rather than longer. And we also lift up Ellen Wiklansky in prayer and ask that God surround her with grace and strength. Lord, in your goodness. Yes, Kay. Yes, so a huge thank you from also Sharon McGilvery's family for the collation and the service this past week. I can tell you that after the service, during the collation, I had so many people come to me and praise this congregation for the caring and the love that we all know and sometimes take for granted. And so we give thanks for this community of faith and all that it was able to do for Sharon's family. Lord, in your goodness. We also lift up Rory Stimson. She is the daughter of Scott and Kathy Stimson. She is in the Air Force and has just been deployed to Qatar. We ask that God watch over her and all those who serve overseas. Lord, in your goodness. We lift up Andrew Vontalidis as he prepares to head to Columbia to teach English there and ask that God be with him. Lord, in your goodness. We continue to pray for Sandy Hayes' son, Billy, as he continues his recovery from stem cell plants plant. We also pray for Kelly Piacopoulos and Melanie Nash as they continue their journey to healing following their strokes. Lord, in your goodness. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for this day for this season of sunshine and warmth. We give you thanks for the opportunity to 
rest and relax and maybe take life at a little slower pace. We ask that you watch over all in this community of faith as they travel to mountains, to seashores, to places that are special to them. Lord God, we ask that your spirit be upon us, but even more so, we pray that our hearts and our minds might be open to your spirit, that we may hearken to your wisdom and your ways, and that we may fall, faithfully follow the risen Christ and be ambassadors of his love and instruments of his peace in our troubled world and these troubled times. Holy One, we know that you have heard our prayers, both those that we have spoken and those that are stirring in our hearts. And for that, we give you thanks. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the book of the prophet Amos, the eighth chapter, beginning with the first verse. Amos, as you will see, has some strong words of warning for the people of Israel who lived in the northern kingdom. A couple of bits of information that will help you to make sense of this reading. In verse 9, Amos talks about an ephah and a shekel. Shekel was a monetary unit. An ephah was a measurement similar to a bushel. And also he talks about selling the shaft of wheat. And there are two possible meanings for that. One is that the shaft of wheat refers to merchants who are adding the byproducts of the wheat and mixing it in with the regular grain. It's also possible that what Amos is referring to here is the gleanings that people who own fields were supposed to leave on the wheat. And the reason for that was that it made it possible for those who were poor and could not afford to buy wheat, they were welcome to take the gleanings. We read these words. This is what the Lord showed me. Behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come upon my people Israel. I will never pass by them again. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, declares the Lord God. So many dead bodies, they are thrown everywhere. Silence. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with those false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has shown by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account? And everyone mourn who dwells in it? And all of it like the Nile, 
and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt. And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will make it like the morning for an only sun and the begin end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I shall send famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Here ends the reading of God's word. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts upon the scripture be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and always our Redeemer. Amen. Thus says the Lord, the end has come upon my people Israel. Never again shall I pass by them. Thus says the Lord, in that day all the songs in the temple shall be turned to wailings. Thus says the Lord, so many dead bodies. Thus says the Lord, I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentations. Thus says the Lord, I will put sackcloth on every waist and bring baldness upon every head. You know, when you hear pronouncements like that, you have to wonder if Amos was a little like a young pastor who found himself in a really awkward situation shortly after he arrived at his first church. That church was way out in the country, and it was small, so small that a couple of months after he got there, the only person who showed up one Sunday morning was an old retired farmer. So the young pastor asked the farmer what he should do. The old man shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I ain't no preacher, but if I went out to the field with a load of hay and only one cow showed up, I'd still feed it. Well, those words of wisdom inspired the young pastor, and he began to preach. He preached and preached and preached. He preached like he had never preached before. And the more he preached, the more fired up he got. Finally, after an hour and ten minutes, the young pastor took a deep breath and finally said, Amen. When he asked the farmer what he thought of the sermon, the old man shrugged his shoulders and said, Well, I ain't no preacher, but if I went out to the field with a load of hay and only one cow showed up, I wouldn't dump the whole load on it. <laughs> Amos, I bet you're wondering what this has to do with Amos. <laughs> Amos dumped a whole load of gloom and doom on the people of Israel. A whole load of it. And the reason why Amos did that is simple. Amos did it because he knew that time was running out for the people who lived in the northern kingdom of Israel. Because they were not faithfully following the God who brought them up out of slavery in Egypt, Amos knew that disaster was waiting for them down the road. And guess what? Amos was right. As we saw last week, that disaster came when the Assyrians swooped down from the north and conquered the kingdom of Israel. From that point on, the kingdom of Israel ceased to exist. Now here's a question for you. Do you think Amos would say the same thing to us today? Do you think Amos would say that disaster is waiting for all of us down the road? 
As you ponder that question, here's an eye-opening statistic. According to a poll that was released just two weeks ago, 85% of the people who were surveyed said that this country is heading in the wrong direction. 85%. Now, most of those people probably wouldn't say it, but I'll say it. That wrong direction is away from God. That wrong direction is away from God's wisdom. It's away from God's will. And in the words of the prophet Amos, it is away from God's call to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. With all of the mass shootings that we're seeing, it's obvious that we are moving away from God's commandment that says, thou shalt not kill. With all of the parking lots that are full on Sunday morning at Walmart, it's obvious that we're moving away from God's commandment that says, keep the Sabbath holy. With white supremacists marching through the streets of Boston on the 4th of July, no less, and attacking a black man, it's obvious that we are moving away from God's call that says, love your neighbor as yourself. All of this is why there's some wisdom in the variation of a poem that all of us heard many times when we were growing up. The original poem was written by Clement Moore, and the variation goes like this. "'Twas a night like all others, and all through the house, not a person was praying, not one in the house. The children were changing to climb into bed, never once, bu never once kneeling down or bowing their heads. And mom in the rocker, with babe in her lap, was watching the late show as I grabbed a snack. When out of the east there arose such a clatter, I sprang to my feet to see what was the matter. Away to the woman window I flew like a flash, threw open the shutters and lifted the sash, when what to my wondering eyes should appear but angels proclaiming that Jesus was here. The light from his face made me cover my head. Was Jesus returning just like he had said? And though I possessed worldly wisdom and wealth, I wept when I saw him in spite of myself. In the book of life which he held in his hand was written the name of every saved man. He spoke not a word as he searched for my name. When he said, it's not here, my head hung in shame. But the people whose names were written with love, he gathered to take to his father above. I fell to my knees, but it was too late. I'd waited too long and thus sealed my fate. So I knelt and I wept as they rose out of sight. If only I'd known that this was the night. Good people, I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever that Amos would tell us that the clock is ticking when it comes to this land that we love. That's why God really needs you. God really needs me. God really needs us. You see, we are what the prophets of the Old Testament, including Amos, referred to as the faithful remnant. So God needs us to faithfully and fully follow the risen Christ so we can do what we can to turn things around before it's too late. Now, there are two ways that you can do that. The first way is the fire and brimstone approach. That's when people of faith belittle and berate those who do not measure up to their standards of what they believe it means to be good and righteous and holy. The only thing that approach does, though, is turn people off and make people of faith like us look bad. Fortunately, there is another approach, a better approach, an approach that can really 
turn things around. It's the approach that a man by the name of Donald Tippett used many years ago when he was attacked late one night. It happened at a YMCA where he worked. That YMCA was located on New York's lower east side. Well, late one night, two teenagers broke into the building and stole the money out of a cash register. As they were leaving, they saw Donald Tippett sitting at the telephone switchboard. Because they were afraid he might call the police, they attacked him. They beat him with brass knuckles and a tire iron, and then stuffed his body behind a radiator near the swimming pool. Several hours later, Donald Tippett's body was found when an Olympic swimmer by the name of Gertrude Adelaide walked by the radiator and found herself standing in a pool of blood. Donald Tippett was rushed to a nearby hospital where he lingered between life and death for several days. Eventually, he did recover, but he lost the sight in one of his eyes. And that's actually an important detail for the end of the story. Well, because he survived, he was able to identify the two teenagers when they were arrested. When they appeared in court for a pre-trial hearing, Donald Tippett surprised the two teenagers as well as the lawyers and the judge. You see, instead of looking for revenge, Donald Tippett asked the judge to release the two young men into his custody. When the judge asked him why he wanted to do that, Tippett said that it was because he believed in them and he wanted to help them change their lives for the better. Well, one of those teenagers didn't change and he was eventually arrested for another crime. The second teenager, though, felt blessed to have been given this second chance and he was determined to make the most of it. He eventually went to college and medical school and not surprisingly, he became an eye surgeon. Donald Tippett's life also changed after that fateful night. He also went back to school and he was eventually ordained. He went on to become a bishop in the United Methodist Church, Bishop Donald H. Tippett of San Francisco. Good people, Amos might say that the clock is ticking and that time is running out. But there is hope. There is good news. And you'll see it in this quote. The end is near, but the beginning is closer. What does that mean? The end is near, but the beginning is closer. Well, you'll find that beginning in the love of Jesus Christ. And you'll find that beginning every time you take the blessings that we experience here each and every week and you go out there and you share them. You'll find that new beginning every time you share the love of the risen Christ with someone who is searching or struggling, or maybe even suffering. You'll find that new beginning every time you share with someone the love of Christ that is still changing lives for the better. Changing lives for the better and nations for the better. Amen.
We have a hymn, but the hymn number wasn't written. So you're going to have to bear with me to see if I can find it quickly for you. And Horatio, if you find it before me, let me know. It's number 310. He lives. I serve a risen Savior. I serve a risen saint. People of God, our service of worship has ended. Let us prepare to go forth wherever we may be to continue our service of love, knowing that our God goes before us. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Creator Christ and Holy Spirit, be upon you all. Amen. Amen.